So this was an interesting topic because we really don't know any way for sure to prevent atopic dermatitis, but it, it got me thinking about where we're going. And as we start to learn more about atopic dermatitis, I think we're going to start learning more about how we might prevent it. Now, when we think about levels of prevent, uh, prevention, uh, we need to think about primary prevention, that is to prevent the disease onset and uh, perhaps remove risk factors. We can think about secondary prevention, that is detecting early and treating to prevent progression. And then we can think about tertiary prevention as well, reduce atopic dermatitis complications and severity once it's established. I'm going to be talking today oh, about primary prevention, um, trying to prevent atopic dermatitis from developing in the first place. Now, there have been proposed several approaches to primary prevention. Uh, one of them is oral probiotics. Now, we're talking about topicals today, but I do want to mention that there's growing evidence that uh, if probiotics are given in the last trimester of pregnancy and then the first six months of life, regardless of whether the patients are high risk or an unselected population, there seems to be benefit, and particularly if one uses uh, mixtures of bacterial strains. So verdict's still out, but that actually looks like it might be promising, as opposed to just starting probiotics when someone has developed atopic dermatitis or not giving it uh, um, early on. What about dietary restriction? Well, that's currently not recommended. Not recommended for either the mother or the child. And I remind you that there's growing evidence that actually exposure is good for those who are at risk of developing uh, allergic disorders. Just uh, as an example, the whole LEAP study that showed that sustained peanut consumption in high-risk infants beginning during the first year can reduce the risk of peanut allergy. What about dust mite reduction? Well, that currently is also not recommended. But what we'll talk about today specifically is focused on the skin barrier approach. That is with the concept that once the barrier is disrupted, transcutaneous antigen exposure is increased, environmental factors can in enhance the risk of developing atopic dermatitis and increase the risk of more severe atopic dermatitis developing. So we'll focus on that. There we go. Um, and when we think about the barrier, uh, it takes us back to studies that were done in the no late 1990s uh, by Jonathan Spurgel and, and others where models of mice with atopic dermatitis could be developed by disrupting the barrier using tape strip skin and then applying an antigen like ovalbumin to the tape strip skin and developing atopic dermatitis and then going on from there to giving inhaled ovalbumin and developing a model for asthma. And these all really suggested the predisposition to atopic dermatitis and other atopic disorders through this barrier impairment. And then along came a birth cohort study in Ireland with about 1,900 babies. Uh, and barrier function was measured at birth and subsequently based on transepidermal water loss, which we know to be a measure of functional barrier. In, uh, and then these patients were followed for the development of atopic dermatitis by 12 months of age. And overall, it occurred in about 15%. And what these investigators from uh, Alan Irvine's group found is that, as we suspected, Family history was very important in increasing the risk with about a tenfold increased risk if one parent and an almost 14-fold increased risk if both parents were affected. Uh, Filagrin mutations made a big difference, um, as we know, uh, increasing the risk of developing atopic dermatitis almost ninefold. But in looking at transepidermal water loss at two days of age in these otherwise healthy babies, that was predictive in this one study of atopic dermatitis risk. And this group found that when the transepidermal water loss was in the upper quartile, there was a more than sevenfold increased risk of developing atopic dermatitis at 12 months. And on the other hand, if the transepidermal water loss was in the lowest quartile, uh, independent, uh, that there was a protection against developing atopic dermatitis. And what was interesting in this particular finding is that it was independent of parental atopy and independent, oh, I'm sorry, this isn't going. That's my fault, I'm not clicking. 
forgot it's animated. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and so what they found is that the transepidermal water loss abnormalities that were predictive were independent of parental atopy or filaggrin mutation status. So I wanted to spend a minute going back to thinking about the barrier early on and whether we have any evidence of what really comprises the barrier abnormality in these young children that might help us then in thinking about the best way to try to protect. Well, we know that there's a barrier abnormality early on because we can look at those patients who have atopic dermatitis in their first six months of age, and we can see that we know that there is already a significant transepidermal water loss abnormality. Um, that is, 32 is the mean transepidermal water loss in a group of patients who are younger than two years of age and in the first six months of atopic dermatitis. And even in the non-lesional skin, 16, half of that, so abnormal transepidermal water loss versus eight for healthy controls. And then when we do biopsies of lesional skin in this group, we can see that there are already deficiencies in the expression of tight junction components, especially Claudin's. And we can see that there are abnormalities as well in the lipids by using Nile red staining in both lesional and non-lesional skin. Uh, we suspect that these are going to show the, the reduction in long-chain fatty acids and ceramides that we see later on in atopic dermatitis uh, based on the fact that there are deficiencies of elongases that are the enzymes required to make these longer chains. But also we see other um, genes that are reduced in their expression patterns in, uh, involved in lipid biosynthesis. So definitely the uh, tight junction components and the lipids at this early time. But what about filaggrin and these uh, epidermal proteins of differentiation? Well, we know from some elegant work from um, uh, Karsten Floor that filaggrin loss of function mutations are associated with early onset atopic dermatitis and increased severity and also transepidermal water loss at three months of age. And in fact, in, in the group from Alan Irvine's uh, group, it, rather the data from Alan Irvine's group, um, you could see a difference starting at that two-month measurement already in those who had the filaggrin deficiency. But it's been shown from, of course, the, the fact that there's a minority of those patients with ichthyosis vulgaris and filaggrin deficiency, as well as that it's overall still a minority of those young children with atopic dermatitis, as well as from mouse models, that having that filaggrin loss of function mutation is neither necessary nor sufficient to cause atopic dermatitis. And in addition to that, uh, studies that we've done collaboratively with uh, Emma Gutman's group have shown that when we take biopsies of these patients with atopic dermatitis early on, we can find a reduced expression of filaggrin in the adults, but not in the young children at this early time to the development of atopic dermatitis. Is this just a gene expression abnormality? No, because when we actually look at the immunohistochemistry findings looking for expression of filaggrin protein, we can see here too that in pediatric atopic dermatitis, a very normal filaggrin pattern. Now, this is from biopsy sections, and one of the things that's been interesting subsequently is that biopsies, of course, are not going to be something that moving forward we can take from young children. It was quite a task to collect these early on. But we know the tape strips are going to be a way in the future that we can uh, take uh, some of the outer layer of skin and uh, examine these in young babies. And Raman spectroscopy is another painless way to try to assess what's going on uh, in the upper epidermis. And interestingly, Raman spectroscopy has shown that filaggrin breakdown products are reduced in babies with atopic dermatitis. And indeed, uh, in some uh, studies that we ha are, will be shortly publishing, uh, using tape strips, we have found a reduction in filaggrin and actual, also in filaggrin 2 mRNA expression, uh, as shown here in looking at the tape strip. So I think the verdict is still out on whether how to explain this versus the, the biopsies, many of them in the same children. Um, but at any rate, it is possible then that some of these uh, epidermal proteins also uh, play a role. So now let's go to taking all of this in mind and moving forward to how we might prevent 
Well, there's been interesting work on water hardness and also some on climate. The work has shown that once you have atopic dermatitis, there's no benefit of water softeners as a treatment of established pediatric AD. However, there are two interesting and complementary studies that were recently published suggesting that the opposite may be true for prevention. In a UK population-based study, 87% increased risk of atopic dermatitis occurred by three months of age if the family was living in a hard water area, and even more so if there was a filaggrin mutation in the affected child. This was confirmed by a cohort study in Denmark showing increased relative risk of atopic dermatitis in the first 18 months of life if exposed to hard domestic water. As a result of this, there is a UK interventional trial right now asking the question of whether having domestic water softeners installed before birth for high-risk children can reduce the risk of developing atopic dermatitis. There's also been some evidence that when you're born makes a difference in your risk. It's not consistent, not shown in every study, but a study that came out fairly recently also, again, the same study, as I mentioned before, from Denmark, showed that autumn winter birth was associated with an increase in atopic dermatitis prevalence. And this is consistent with some of the results from Jonathan Silverberg's work showing that climate makes a difference, lower relative humidity, lower mean temperature, more indoor heating associated with a higher AD prevalence. So that may suggest that if you're going to have a child and you're at increased risk, that you time it well, depending on where you live. All right, moving on to the two areas I'm now going to focus on. One is topical emollients. Can they be used as prevent primary prevention to improve the barrier and suppress inflammation? And then a little bit about can topical microbes be used as primary prevention to alter the microbiome? Hmm. So I want to just point out that we've known that Moisturizers can be very helpful for the barrier for quite a while. Uh, even a small study that came out of Africa in the early 1990s showed that the use of petrolatum was protective against atopic dermatitis. And then work as well that's been done with premature infants has shown that emollients can prevent dermatitis and that emollients also accelerate barrier repair and reduce mortality in premature infants. I'm always fascinated by uh, the work that came out uh, from Talia Sarnowicki and Emma Gutman, showing that if you put just plain inert petrolatum on healthy individuals and on individuals, adults with atopic dermatitis, that just petrolatum alone increases innate immunity, increases the expression of antimicrobial peptides in filaggrin, while reducing T cell infiltration and stratum corneum thickness in adult non-lesional AD skin. Again, reminding us that when we're doing soaking and sealing, we're not just sealing against water loss or against the ingress of potential triggers, but we're also potentially protecting uh, the barrier and reducing inflammation. <coughs> Sorry, this is not easy to do. <laughs> hmm. Let's see, ah. did that work? No. Okay, well, can we improve the barrier and prevent atopic dermatitis? Um, and so we have our schematic here with the concept that if we improve the barrier, we'll block that inflammatory cascade um, and, and help to reduce the risk. So what is the best moisturizer? I've just listed several randomly here to show you we have so many to choose from. Some are even by prescription. Most of these are over the counter. And there is no real evidence overall to support that one moisturizer is superior to another in treating atopic dermatitis. Now, in fact, there was a study within 39 children that randomly applied some uh, prescription products that, that moisturize very well and have um, agents within them that may be helpful to reduce inflammation versus Aquaphor, a bland emollient, applied three times per day and as you can see here, um, this over the, these over-the-counter moisturizer was clinically as effective and more cost-effective as shown here than these uh, prescription barrier 
creams in this randomized control trial. On the other hand, there is some evidence from Cochrane systematic review that shows, first of all, not surprisingly, that there are fewer flares and less use of topical steroids when moisturizers are used. So talking about their benefit and that adding moisturizers to topical anti-inflammatory is more effective than anti-inflammatory treatment alone, but also that some of these additives like glycerol retinic acid, urea, a glycerol containing cream can work better than control vehicles or no moisturizer at secondary prevention. So what is the ideal moisturizer to use? Well, studies have shown that patients will use what the doctor recommends. Or if they really don't like it, they won't use it and they'll pick something else. And of course, we know our patients all go online and they're very susceptible to trying new things. But patients overall have been shown to like low cost, easy application, and for milder atopic dermatitis, using moisturizers twice a day for more severe, sometimes three times a day. Uh, that was in a study. I'm not sure I can get my patients to do it that often. But nevertheless, they recognize the value of using moisturizers. Ideally allergen-free, but in a very interesting study that came out a few years back, looking at over-the-counter moisturizers, only 12% of the best-selling ones were allergen-free. And even 45% of the products that claimed to be fragrance-free had one or more fragrance cross-reacting or botanical ingredient. So it's been sh it was shown in that a study that products without allergenic ingredients were no more expensive, but often dermatologist recommended products were more expensive. So this is a study that uh, was performed as a preliminary trial to then address the question of which is the best moisturizer if we're going to use it in a trial, what do parents most like to put on? And this was a study that was performed by uh, Eric Simpson's group with Hal Williams' group. Uh, in the US and in the UK, in which they did a randomized control trial basically to ask the question, which moisturizer would people actually use? In 124 high-risk infants, these were instructed in the first month of life to at least apply daily the full-body emollient versus the controls that were asked not to use emollients. And what it turned out was when looking at this group of agents with an oil, a cream, and an ointment, although different creams and ointments in the US versus the UK, the families favored the cream, or in the case of the UK, the double-based gel, uh, over the oil, over the ointment, uh, even though so many of our patients prefer to use ointments, at least for prevention, the families preferred the cream. Um, and in this very early study, just looking not for, um, not powered really to produce any results, there was at six months a relative risk reduction of 50% uh, in those developing atopic dermatitis who used the topical moisturizer. And indeed, there was also a trial out of Japan in 118 high-risk neonates where at 32 weeks, 32% fewer infants with emollient had atopic dermatitis. Uh, and in that, they also looked at sensitization and found sensitization rates for eggs similar between the two groups. One more trial that's been done to address this question, this was a, the, uh, a pilot study for Peebles in Australia in which 1,300 high-risk infants, that is with a family history of allergy or atopic dermatitis, were enrolled by three weeks of age, twice daily application in this case of epicerum, which uh, is said to have a physiologic ratio of ceramides to cholesterol to free fatty acids and a low pH of five, and this was applied in the first six months. Um, and then these patients were also prick tested as well to try to see if they might have uh, those with um, those who had an average of five times per week. And what you can see here, in just looking at the relative risk, uh, there is a reduction here, but it didn't quite reach the p value. Perhaps not um, adequately powered when you're looking either at uh, the investigator absorbed atopic dermatitis or, or actually at the, the parental um, assessment. And when we looked at the results from the prick test reactivity for those who use the emollient, we can see that the epicerum 
did markedly reduce the proportion of those children who were sensitized, whether we're talking about cow's milk, egg, peanut, or any food at all, and that reached statistical significance. So suggested through these trials that this might be a good approach. And as a result, there are now some larger ongoing trials. This is the Cascade study that Eric Simpson uh, has initiated uh, with the goal of 1,250 babies, two-year endpoint, uh, all done electronically at multiple sites around the country. <laughs> And then other barrier prevention studies that are in progress, including now the BEEP study going on uh, in England and, and also with, with Dr. Simpson, the PEBBLE study in Australia, the PREVENT AD all in Norway, and then two studies as well in Japan. So as you can see, they, they're all moving forward, but it will take years before we see the results from those larger trials. Finally, I just want to ask the question about do microbiome changes precede atopic dermatitis? Of course, with the idea that if that were the case, we might be able to introduce microbiome that could change that. So we know, of course, with the AD flares, there's that shift towards uh, Staph aureus and some epidermidis with a reduction in the bacterial diversity uh, that is in commensals. And we, of course, know that the commensal bacteria play an important anti-inflammatory role, primarily from the work from Rich Gallo. There have been some interesting results as well, looking early on before the occurrence of atopic dermatitis. So again, from Alan Irvine's group, a lower risk of atopic dermatitis at 12 months when the patients are colonized with commensal staphylococci at two months of age, although no significant differences in bacterial diversity. On the other hand, from uh, Stephanie Christian Zake's group in Switzerland, um, she found the presence of Staph aureus in the axillary area at three months was associated with an increased risk of developing atopic dermatitis, regardless of whether they were high-risk children or not. Now, she also found the prevalence of Staph hominis at three months tended to be lower in infants who developed atopic dermatitis, uh, but it didn't quite reach statistical significance, but provided, again, some evidence that this may be important. So what about emollients as preventing the increase in bacterial species and diversity? Uh, and here's some recent work that actually was linked to the study I showed you earlier from Eric Simpson's group, but this is work done on the microbiome specifically. And they took a, a subset of these that were studied at Oregon. Uh, it turned out that three with atopic dermatitis were excluded, so altogether 10 on emollients and nine on controls, and they evaluated the microbiome at six months of age, and as you can see, uh, the skin pH tended to be lower in those who were treated with emollient, but there was also a significant increase in the um, chow richness, um, and a trend at least toward an increase in the Shannon index with also a significant increase in those treated with emollients in um, a commensal bacterium called Streptococcus salivarius. So again, suggestive that perhaps if we're increasing the microbiome, it may make a difference. So just to remind you of some of the work that's been done, um, there's now evidence that coagulase negative staphylococci produce antimicrobial factors that selectively kill Staph aureus. Uh, and you can see here that in patients who have atopic dermatitis in the lesional skin and, and to a lesser extent in the non-lesional skin, um, there are fewer of these commensals that are able to kill staph bacteria. And Rich Gallo in his work was able to tease these out, grow them up, and put them on the arm skin of patients with atopic dermatitis, and within a single application after 24 hours, found a decrease in the growth of Staph aureus on those, uh, from those patients. And then in another study, um, among gram-negative skin bacteria, Rosiomonas mucosa, from healthy volunteers was found to improve outcomes in mouse and in cell culture models of atopic dermatitis. Uh, and in fact, uh, Rosiomonas mucosa from atopic dermatitis subjects worsened the outcomes in these models. Again, suggesting that it's not just the staph, these gram-positive, but also gram-negative commensals. And so this group then went on to show that in an open-label study with 10 adults and five children, gram-negative commensal Rosam uh, Rosamonas mucosa sprayed onto the antecubital fossa led to the improvement both in local score ed and in itch and reduced the use of 
steroid in, in these patients with atopic dermatitis. And these studies together support that commensal organisms may be not only atopic dermatitis therapy, but possibly prevention in well, as well. So in summary, the impaired barrier is present before disease onset and represents a major risk factor for developing atopic dermatitis and allergic sensitization. Early barrier impairment involves a deficiency of lipids, tight junction proteins, and maybe stratum corneum barrier proteins. Non-lesional skin has an impaired barrier as well. It is not healthy skin. And early evidence suggests that emollient use from the first weeks of life may reduce the risk of developing atopic dermatitis and possibly associated allergic disorders. So questions remain, what is the optimal emollient? What should the duration of therapy be? And what might the effect be on allergic comorbidities? And finally, given that reduced microbial diversity may increase the risk of atopic dermatitis development, should topical application of commensal organisms be tested to prevent atopic dermatitis? And I thank you very much for your attention.